and I'm making chicken too. Shake and bake. Can you believe it? Shake and bake. Shake and bake. This is the secret though tonight. Shake and bake. Thighs. Chicken, chicken thighs, you have to. But it's for pork, not for chicken. But we're using it, so we'll You're see. You're using pork season seasoning on chicken. Is that like a life hack? That's a good life. Yes, it is a life hack. It's also, I think, it's a, it's a songwriting hack. Because Paul and I are writing songs, and we needed to switch it up a little. So I said, let's make some chicken thighs with pork seasoning. This band thing, is, it's, like, it's like a real thing now. You We've know? been writing songs. Yeah, we're writing songs. <laughs> yeah. It just seemed like a good thing to do in our early 60s. Yeah. yeah. Turn 60, you went, you know what? It's time to get that band back together again that never took off. Yeah. <laughs> I hear from people who have been in bands and, and bands who have broken up. And, and certainly during the pandemic, a lot of bands who had broken up have gotten back together. And I, yeah. I compare it to people getting back with their exes during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but at a certain point in your life, like even if there isn't a pandemic, you you start to realize like, hey, maybe there's only, eh, I don't have a ton of time left to necessarily do this stuff. Absolutely true. Especially for rock and roll. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, so actually, and so we're doing a show in Philadelphia coming up. But someone asked us to do a show and we just went, yeah, why not? So it's in May, May 21st, I think. Yeah, May 21st. And we thought, well, why not write a bunch of new songs for it? So we're probably going to be... Debuting about five new songs. Hopefully. About five songs. and we're, about another six or seven of the old ones. But we're doing two sets, two hour sets. Like I can't, And they're going to show our documentary. So yeah. it's quite exciting. Maybe the one place in the United States to watch the documentary right now. Because I, I looked around for it. Oh, you know, no one can see. No one's seen it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's more obscure than our, well, our music career. Well, we don't have a distributor or nothing. nothing. It's, it, it just, it's just there. So, and it's right after the Kids in the Hall debut, so it's the worst career move. Just suddenly you go, you have a show, you haven't been on the air in like 25 years, and what do you do? Yeah, we're doing a very obscure punk show to 80 people in a very weird venue in Philadelphia. It makes You're kind of turning on, on its own head what you did last time, right? I mean, the Kids in the Hall is kind of the reason why Mouth Congress stopped being a thing initially. Yes, yep. So now it's basically we're fucking we're fucking kids in the hall up and saying, you know, what? this isn't what's important. What's important is this Mouth Congress show, not this Amazon Prime series around the world. No, it's this show for 80 people. I assume you've written all of the, the episodes and everything and, and, you go. and you've shot it and it's in the can right now. So, like, there's only really so much you can actually do with the show. Yeah, all that's left is the cancellation. <laughs> And when you say cancellation, you mean the cancellation of the show or you mean the cancellation of the individual members? All of it. <laughs> all, take, It'll all happen at once. Take your pick. That's yeah. the thing. It's going to be very economical. It's going to happen at once. <laughs> That's a platform. It's called platforming. Yeah. Yeah. A deep platforming. Yeah. I, it's platforming. Called deep platforming. Yes, it's called deep platforming. It's called defunding and deplatforming at once. At the same time. <laughs> the, and defund the police, defund Mouth Congress. There's a very big movement out there to defund Mouth Congress. And I'm, you know what? We're behind it. Mm-hmm. We're just saying that we are actually behind it. We're the shadow. I know that politics in Canada are as, if not more, divisive than they are right now. And, I, and this is certainly something that everybody can get behind. Well, I must say, this is part of what's happened. When your country is in the throes of a revolution, (laughs) you you start writing songs again. And one of the songs is absolutely inspired by what's happened. It's called Honk. So It's about the truckers. It's about the truckers. Did your prime minister say, hey, guys, listen, We've got what? What? Don't please don't please don't get my bank account closed. <laughs> no, I was gonna say we need. I we just need started, to- Paul. I just started making money again, and now you're gonna fuck it up and get the government to close our bank Seize accounts. Your I was gonna say wow. that that Prime Minister Trudeau came to you guys and said, "Listen, we need something for both sides to rally behind, oh. and the cancellation of Mouth Congress could be that thing." Well, it's a beautiful distraction away from all the protests. And let's be, I don't, let me just say, he won't be coming to us for this song. <laughs> he'll be coming for us to get to our heads. To try to, yes, he'll be coming for our heads. But let's, let's, we should move on. Can you, you can't give me a little hint of uh, like suddenly, some lyrics or? No. Mm. No, I mean, let's just say, all I'm saying is, Kids in the Hall, we don't, we, our songs are completely non judgmental. 
we take on the point of view of whoever the person singing the song is or whatever. So it, let's just say it's a, it's a song in the spirit of like a, a like a like a, a protest song, I guess it would be. Would you call Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I'd say, is it destined to be the next blowing in the wind? We'll see. We don't know. Time will tell. Mm. <laughs> but yes, it is a. <laughs> we'll know by the end of the summer. <laughs> but it is definitely a fertile time in this country for um, creating things. And a fertile time for for you two. It sounds like it's surprising that you're getting back together and writing songs given that I listened to the interview that you did at WFMU. And I think you, I think the number you mentioned was 604 songs that you put on Bandcamp. Um, yeah. But at least 500 are just jams. Yeah. You know, look, we, I like that's to still do a pretty good, that's a pretty good average song. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, and so we, we, I think we're going to have probably five new songs. Well, we're shooting for a new album. Yeah, we're going to make a, a, an album album. Like, a, a statement. Yeah, like I think we want to do another album of stuff from the past that we have because we have so much material that we yeah. could, you know, clean up, etc. But I think we want to make a new album as well. I, well, we are. We realized, we said it today. Oh, my God, we're writing an album. Yeah. That dawned on you today? Yeah. Well, it's good building yeah. because we rehearse every Wednesday night in Scott's living room. Living I mean, that's room. how low key we are right mm-hmm. now. We have a beatbox, we have a bass player and a guitar player. Yeah. And the two of us, we don't, Scott and I don't even need mics. You know, we're we literally no sitting mics. in a living room on couches doing these kind of little jam sessions and rehearsals. And, and, you know, when we start performing again, I mean, the show in Philadelphia won't have a drummer, but if we did it, if something got bigger, we would, have, we would get Steve back to do the drumming. Yeah. But I can't really have a drummer because people will complain. In the living room, yes. Because we are rehearsing in the living in room. In the living room. My understanding was that you had had complaints earlier in the pandemic, Scott. Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. I had a lot of complaints because I was talking to myself a lot. And so they were saying that I was throwing <laughs> pandemic parties, but no, it was just me. Well, if you could kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and, uh, oh. you know, maybe not the specifics on what you're saying, but that was at such a volume that your neighbors complained. God, and in character. Or fuck, Bruce, what the fuck are you up to now? Motherfucker! <laughs> fuck, he's up to his old fucking tricks! No, that sounds like a party. Oh, that's the party. <laughs> that's not a character. That's not a character. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, I, I said that, that they were characters just so I didn't look completely insane. <laughs> but I'll be, come on. Who hasn't lost them, their marbles a little bit the last this few years? This is Toronto. Everybody complains about everything. They do. And, well, it's just, you, there's no escaping. And it. you know how hard it's been in this country. What, how bad? It, well, you can, you can, I think. Oh, the, our restrictions were just. I think the truck, so the trucker so thing, you can see. Impressive. I think people outside are starting to realize how rough it was in a few countries. And this was one of them. The fact that Canadian events had made the American news for longer than a week is pretty remarkable at the end of the day. You know, it's kind of, a, it tends to be a one way road yeah. when it comes to politics. No, what happened, this country, something burst the last couple of weeks. It just burst. And um, we're going to write songs about it yeah. and and we're and you know what we're, we're the ones that are going to benefit from it all it's an opportunity to be you know to, to, to touch on current events in the way that maybe you know sketch yeah. comedy doesn't afford that's absolutely true yeah certainly yeah. when you're working you know writing an entire season in advance the way you have been so you know like the songs we're writing i mean we, we always try to make things more like um universal and we try to like put myth into them and make them like the song that we're writing it honk it's definitely definitely it's inspired by what's happening but it's also got a real story to it like yeah, a little, it's just about populist movements and yeah it could have been written a thousand years ago about a king speaking truth to power yeah. all that kind of stuff it's exactly it's about a king it sounds like you actually weren't expecting all that much out of this project well you know what happened like when capture tracks put out our record and i think when they shipped it to us and we looked at it, and it was a real thing. And it, it took so 35 years for us to get this done. And I think that kind of made us think, this was fun, and we should maybe keep doing it. Yeah. And we had to promote the record, so we had to do a, a couple of shows for our record launch. And that brought us back together with our musicians. And the next yeah. thing you know, that was fun. we find we like each other's company. We all need something yeah. to do. We're so Bored. People have been locked down for so long here. And the idea of performing is so liberating, so exciting. And, and also, we're creative by nature. We just, Scott and I write constantly, yeah. as you can imagine. 
And I love the idea because, you know, the kids in the hall experience the last two years has been something. And, um, you know, it's been wonderful. Something. something is a good way to put it, isn't it? Okay. It's been a little um, bit of everything, maybe? Been, well, the most beautiful part was the five of us. That was the good part. I just, it's been rough. I'm just saying it's been, it's been tough. It's been, it's been a tough time to write comedy. So it, this was a real experience, a chance to just not have anyone worry about it because no, there, the stakes, there are no stakes. There are no stakes. Even there, there could be. I'm sure there will. There are always stakes nowadays. It was pure. It's pure. I thought, oh, that's just fucking right stuff with pure expression and having no one say, you can't say that. That will upset someone. Because we know that our songs are going to upset people. Yeah, and, but we also are entertainers, right? Yeah. So, like, we're writing another song where Scott and I are uh, two hot girls oh, God, yeah. who have been doing nothing for two years except dieting and working out. And their bodies are in peak condition. Yeah. And they're dying to go out and meet men, right? They're about 20. And they go to a club and basically just flirt with men all night. And it's kind of like a post-pandemic vision. Yes. Yeah, and... It's us pretending to be young girls. I Beautiful mean, it's, young it's girls. Fucking hilarious. Who spent two years getting them getting the body of a lifetime. They didn't they didn't waste it. And now they gotta show it off. So it's about that. So we take on their personalities, but it's just about just dressing in like a no. skirt that does barely covers anything. <laughs> yeah. No underwear. You're inhabiting characters, but is there a sense in which you feel like you're in sort of a peak condition because you've been working on this stuff for so long? Physically we're no. wrecked. That's, that's what makes a funny Comedic, no, Comedically, look. perhaps? Maybe comedically, <laughs> but like everybody is ragged now. Don't you think? I was noticing the other day, like all, like I'm watching, you know, I've been watching, of course, the glued to the news constantly. And I'm noticing all the, all the broadcasters, everybody, every reporter looks ragged. Like everyone looks terrible. Like the woman who does the main news reader here in this country, she just looked the other day, I won't even say her name, but. She looked so rough, like her hair was wrong and her gray was coming out. And she wasn't prepared for what was happening. She wasn't ready for this. And her dress doesn't work. It doesn't fit. And she's obviously 10 pounds over, 15 yeah, pounds over. A lot over. of people are bloated. Everyone looks bloated. And it's kind of, it's, it's in a strange, it's very human in a weird way. But like you look at actors and you're like, holy cow, they don't look so good. And they're all trying to pretend that they're in peak physical condition, but you're like, nobody is. And if you are, you're a psychopath. <laughs> That's part of the good thing of, of both the, the kids and, and Mouth Congress is, you know, is, is there's humor and perhaps not necessarily being in peak physical condition when you're wearing those costumes. There was always room in comedy for the funny fat guy, right? You specifically, obviously, uh, through the kids, you're best known for wearing a towel. What an easy job. <laughs> I mean, in a certain sense, yeah, but how many people can actually go out and do that? I mean, how many people would go out and do that is probably a better way of putting it. Yeah. Um, given the opportunity, maybe a lot. I don't right. know. Look, oh, there's the chicken. Four chicken thighs. Hold it up. Mm, this smells thighs. great. Done in Mom. pork. Pork shake. fantastic. Shake and bake. Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, no, that's, that's going to be succulent. Of things, I think have come back during the pandemic. Board games and shake and bake. <laughs> twister and shake and bake. Wow. Twister, <laughs> twister. Well, you could twister a with yourself. Me and my cats. I was playing twister with my cats. <laughs> I bought a new vacuum cleaner and I love vacuuming. I have a lot of hardwood floors, so I'm mopping a lot, but I, I do quite enjoy it. You don't have to. I mean, you could just let everything get really horrible, but. The, the the new equipment inspires me. I want to use it all the time, you know? I live in this one bedroom in New York. You know, I'll go out for something and come back and then realize that, like, I've slowly transformed into a hoarder over the past two years. And it and it yeah. freaks me out a little bit, frankly. So I, I do I do get the fire in me to, to do some major cleaning every about once a week or so. I am finally cleaning out all of my archives and donating them to something. Because I have tons of shit going back to the very beginning of Kids and Mouth Congress. I have a lot of really good stuff. And it's just sitting in a closet in plastic bins. And I'm kind of tired of dragging the same shit to every different move, right? And I thought, why don't I just donate it somewhere now while I'm still alive to be able to do this properly? So that's my big project. This is the moment, though. I mean, 
stories and everything sort of seems to be hitting at once for you guys. It's weird. Are you saying they were, they were going to have a moment, a cultural moment? I, I think you're having a moment. I, you know, you, you sort of sit back and, and enjoy it. I mean, I know, I Scott, you had the, I think the so. buddy thing a few years ago, but the kids in mouth Congress happening at the same time is pretty wild. It is weird. Um, it's very exciting because I, I really we, we were ready two years ago for everything. It was all supposed to happen. But you know what? It's going to be so much sweeter because of the wait. Paul, I know you had a health scare a couple of years ago. Was that a motivator for you? Did you have that sort of that moment of time? Time is precious. I need to sort of get out there. And I'll tell you, it was so weird. I was going for a routine hernia surgery. And on the day before, I dug out my will and left it on my desk. Why? I don't know. It's just one of those creepy things that people do. Are you the kind of person who just does that sort of thing? or I don't know. It was weird even for me, to be honest. Uh, and then I went and I had the surgery. It went fine. On the second day, I aspirated in my sleep, which is basically breathing in my own vomit and suffocating. So you have to be, you know, resuscitated. And I was in a coma for days. And and I wake up and I see him. <laughs> Quite excited. And was that, was that a motivator or not? Seeing Scott in the room. No, well, kind of. I think the real motivation was that I had, I had snuck in the the uh, basically our new album because Paul we hadn't heard it properly. Right, right. So right. Paul was like, you know, laying out. Yeah, I brought you something. Room. He brought me headphones. Brought him headphones. And he played it for me. And played it for him, and that made him decide to live. Yeah. He said, "Listen, how great this sounds! It's our album." You can't die. I mean, it'd make a great story, but still. <laughs> Aspirating is a, is a very rock and roll way to go at the end of the day. It is. Isn't it but, so John Bonham? But, but when you're 30, it's rock and roll. Not when you're That's right. 60. It's just sad. <laughs> it would say Paul Bellini joined the 60 Club. <laughs> Not the 60 Club. Exactly. The 60 Club. Exactly. Nothing's glamorous at 60. You can't get, you, you don't look good wet. You don't look good when you die. Everything's a, a nightmare. All you can do is write songs. The only thing that looks good is your work. Or, or just sort of lean into it and, and, you know, be a 60 year old punk rocker in a dress. Because there are kids out there that like old guys. It's crazy. So, and I think there's kids out there that actually like the punk spirit, that attitude of, of F you and uh, everything's boring and uh, that anxious for change. Uh, you know, you, you look at what punk was in the 70s, it was a reaction to the disco era, basically. And I don't know, sometimes I think we're ripe for that because, I man, so. popular music right now is horrible. I think so. I think definitely change is coming. Hard rain's going to fall. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we'll start hard on. Yeah, I'm just saying this could be our Another Bob Dylan songs. Yeah, <laughs> well, Dylan's an inspiration for this. I must say, is that right? For singers like us, he's a big yeah. inspiration. <laughs> One of the things I was alluding to, you know, in, in terms of Paul, sort of like going out there and you know wearing a, a towel on an international TV show, or the two of you not necessarily being especially musically inclined and deciding that you're going to start a band. Was there any sort of uh, fear or self-doubt when it came to just sort of getting out there and, and putting yourself out there in front of people? No. 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 Does that sound terrible? No. no. I, I'm, I'm jealous. No, I, I, I think people will enjoy this. In those earliest days. Yeah, are you talking about like, what are you talking about? Like years ago? 85. Oh, oh, God, no. Back then it was like, uh, there was nothing like what would have stopped me. I just... No, you know, not we just gotten out of our small towns and we were ready to take on the world. And then, you know, it's also like young gay men like us. But back, back then, oh, my Lord, and then there's a war on. Oh, Lord, it was like jump off a cliff. There's nothing to nothing to lose. Yeah, but we were lucky because everything around us was creativity because he had joined the kids in like uh, the beginning of 1985, which yeah. was around the time Mouth Congress yeah, started. all at the same time. So all these things are happening at the same time. It's all very exciting. And it all feels to be leading somewhere. So we just kind of like just went for a ride. And it was just a group of young people that were all doing the same thing. Yeah, we knew a lot of other people in Lots bands, a lot of other comedians and filmmakers. We, it was a whole scene. Absolutely. And there was no, and it was very little differentiation between like, do you do music? Do you do comedy? Do you both? It was a very, very exciting time. Yeah. And um, yeah, we just, uh, and also both of us came from background. I mean, Paul had a more... I guess a family that encouraged his, his yeah, family. your my mother did. My, yeah, my parents were good about but that. But I wouldn't say we came from like, we weren't from like 
artistic elites or anything like that. They, they, they weren't like artistic people. And my family, there was no encouragement with this at all. So I was like, like out, out of my mind, there's nothing. I can do anything because I can't do anything. Yeah, in terms of performance, remember that was the era of performance art and people like Gigi Allen and all those risk takers on stage, oh, yeah. Iggy Pop, and, and also it was an era where if you didn't have a talent, there was a machine that could take care of that, like beatboxes and, and, and um, certain rhythm patterns and keyboard sounds that actually made it easy for a non-musician to produce an interesting or effective sound. So that was just a great period. Oh, chicken. Ch- chicken's ready again? You know, I think it wasn't quite ready before, but now no, it is. Is there a way in which not being a musician was helpful for the development of the band? Well, frankly, I always wished I had rudimentary skills that yeah, I could pick up a guitar or play a keyboard in the shittiest fashion just to get across a certain idea that I had in my head. Uh, that was always a disadvantage, but I'm lucky. We, we work with guys who... If I sang something, they could try and replicate it, and they would be willing to work with us and, and try things. But I wish I knew more terms. Like, I knew how to ask for something. Like, go, you know that part that we were improvising, and I went, and then you stop, and I went, ah, can we do that? I don't know how to explain. I can barely explain what a, what a you know what I mean, what, what a note is. Or what, you know, that part of the song, I'm very inarticulate about music because I know nothing about it. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I heard that Jello Biafra has a very similar approach where he basically just sings a melody to his band. <laughs> yeah, oh, that sounds very I much believe like, it. That sounds perfect. That sounds just like that. Like I said, we're really lucky. We have musicians that actually can follow but along really and, 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 and interpret our ideas. Yeah. God bless them. Scott kind of alluded to this a little bit before, but almost being benefited by uh, starting out from a, a place of having no expectations. You know, I know initially in those early shows, there was effectively nobody there. And that kind of, that allows you to perhaps take chances that you might not otherwise. Yeah, that's true. And also not knowing what we could and couldn't do. Like there was no idea that we just, we should have just gone, well, one, it should just be one of us be the front man. Why are we both the front man? That makes no sense. And also the naivete that you could have, you couldn't have one gay front man. You couldn't have two gay front men. Like, I mean, come on, it's ludicrous. None of it made any sense, but we didn't really think it through. We just went, this is what we like to do. So I think the absence of an audience was the most liberating thing for us because we never were pulled in any one direction. We didn't try to be better or have hits because it was not relevant. All that was relevant was that we kept coming up with things that amused us and made for a great show. And like Kids in the Hall was already starting to get um, successful. So I kind of knew right from then, like this Kids in the Hall thing is going to take off. I know that. When was that clear to you that Oh, that that was the, the rocket ship. Oh, it was clear before I even joined. Well, specifically, I would say would probably when, when Mark and Bruce were asked to write on SNL uh, back in, I think, September of 86. Yeah, I guess so. And you knew then that if they could do that, then the troupe could probably do anything. And, and a year later, you guys were in New York developing a show. Yeah. So... It actually happened rather quickly. It, happened, it did happen quite quickly when Lauren discovered us. Because Lauren really did discover us in a very cl- cliche way. Yeah. Like in a Hollywood way that almost never happened. He, came, he went back to SNL. He went on a North American tour to find people. And he was told through the SCTV pipeline, the Canadian pipeline, to come to Toronto and see us. He would have come to Toronto anyway. Yeah. And that was it. And then he tried to destroy us in a way. How? He poached Mark and Bruce. Uh. And then thinking that because they were the ones he really wanted and they didn't work out. And then we didn't really work out on our own. And then he realized after a year of that, that, oh, they need to be together. Paul, when did you come along for that ride? Well, Scott and I went to university together. So we had known each other from, what, about 1982? So, um, oh. Yeah, no, even earlier, I think. Um, so, you know, we went to university together and we worked on a student newspaper together. Uh, we made short films together. So we'd already had a long creative history at that point. Uh, and for me, the minute I saw the kids in the hall was a revelation. It was around maybe January, February of 1985. I went to a show 
because I knew he was in it. And I thought, oh, I should be supportive. And it was a revelation. Uh, I, to this day, I remember a couple of sketches. I remember some of the things that they were doing on stage. And it was like nothing else I'd ever seen. So instantly, you know, well, this is different. This is special. The Mouth Carvers was also sort of the, the launching point, Scott, for some of your characters. I mean, wasn't Buddy Cole essentially born on stage? Well, he was actually born in, in Paul's apartment. Yeah, we used first. to just do videos and he'd improvise yeah. the Buddy character for hours. And-, and then I started using that voice to write songs and then started to do it on stage. Yeah. And yeah, that is where, that's where it started. It really, but it really started in Paul's apartment when he got his first video camera. Why, why, why was Buddy a good character specifically for the band? It was good for us because we're gay. Yeah. And he's a gay character that just lets it fly. It yeah, says he it's has, on his mind. Yeah, and he's completely comfortable in his own skin, and I wasn't then, uh, absolutely. And he became a prophet and yeah. a sage. He said the things that we couldn't say. Yeah, and it was a way for me to access that effeminate child in me that I had tried to kill my whole life. And just like taking him and going, I'm sorry, I tried to kill you. I'm going to actually make you a star. Because <laughs> I did try to kill him forever and ever and ever and ever. And then one day when Paul turned the camera on, I went, I'm going to see if I can do that. And then I just did. So it was almost a reclamation from the effeminate boy I had been. Yeah. There were, though, certain subjects that you didn't feel necessarily comfortable discussing on stage that you were able to talk yes. about through him yes and i think at, at times in, in those days i i probably would if i had been a young person today i probably would have gone right into stand-up comedy but that wasn't an opportunity that wasn't real an option then mm-hmm. so i think buddy cole became my stand-up persona where i could say things that I, I i wouldn't be allowed to say as myself now i could now i can but then you had to couch it with that so buddy was a way of softening things because people hear that voice they see that kind of a male and they think that the person is not dangerous. And that's what makes him very dangerous. Because it lulls, Buddy kind of lulls people into thinking he's um, weak. Yeah, and meanwhile he's talking about fisting in like I see. the 80s. Is that what I was talking about? Well, lots. Yeah, I talked about a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> I, just, I just picture Scott just going to like a fugue state and waking up and not realizing. <laughs> I know. It's all on videotape, don't lie. Yeah, what? <laughs> Why would someone talk about things like that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but he anyway. could. But he could talk about anything. He could talk about, about anything. anything. Yeah. So I still use them. I mean, I don't have to. I just like to. Stand-up wasn't viable. I mean, you know, but also, but but was being in a sketch troupe or being in a punk rock band, neither of those were particularly yeah. like... It was, physically. Nothing was viable. You could not be an openly gay viable in show business. No, you would have no career. You would be consigned to the back roads for your whole career. But I think the other kids really liked the idea of having a gay member because it stood out. It was very, I mean, I don't remember other troops who came no, out. No, no one did stuff like that. I just, my whole thing, my, my philosophy was very simple. I just acted like I'm as good as anybody else. I, I deserve to be. Anybody else, I'm nobody's sidekick. I'm the star of my own life. I'm, and therefore, that's the way I'm going to behave. And that was it. That's, that's, a, simple. that's a good song idea. I'm the star of my own I life. I am the star of my own life. I'm no sidekick. And uh, that was it. It was that very simple. There are a lot of discussions these days around things like cancel culture. But I assume that, you know, in, in the early 90s, being on television, there was, especially when it came to LGBT issues, there were a lot of things that, you probably got pushback on early Constantly. on. Are you kidding me? Constantly. It's never been easy for me. I've just been, everything is pushed back. I get pushed back on everything pretty much. That's okay. And I certainly got lost from my community <laughs> to this day. Yeah, to this day. The buddy character is interesting because it does sound like you were, in a sense, getting it from all sides. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, actually, the hardest part, the worst part was from queer people. I don't know how to say it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris, good. what were the objections everything everything because it was like oh you're you're spilling all the secrets you're you're we don't mega. like the, case, the faggy stereotype yeah, we don't yeah we don't like the stereotypes we don't like the the the, the ugliness that you're showing because back then I, it's still that way a lot of the way people think that you have to, if you're a minority you have to like be a representative 
You have to look like, at Hattie McDaniel. Yeah. So you have to, you have to like always represent, right? You are always carrying that mantle and it's very boring for art. Very difficult to make art when artists have, to, when, when you have to give them that mantle of like carrying a torch. It's wild though. Cause I assume that you were, you know, I, I know that, you know, for me as a, as a young kid growing up in the U S you know, seeing, seeing your show on, on comedy central down here, it, it was really one of the few sort of gay characters on television. So like, even, even if you were getting some of that pushback from above, like there was an entire generation of kids that you were. Yeah, no, no. I'm talking about the, the official powers that be, they, they, they didn't have a lot of time for me, but uh, the people did. I was a people's princess, (laughs) you know? So that's what I think. Do you feel like you get sort of grandfathered in, you know, like. I get away with it more now. Yeah, yeah. In, in, you know, in terms of like being sort of like iconic or having sort of been pioneering on television, do you think that that affords you a little uh, leeway? That you have my, white male, my white maleness? Perhaps. Hopefully. Got my fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see how long that lasts. How long my grandfather claws lasts. What was that experience of, of touring on Buddy like, uh, I think about what, two, right before the pandemic, right? 2019? Oh, it was very exciting. I, it's, a, it's a show that I love and I will bring it back. I'm going to bring it back in the new year, this year. Um, very thrilling. Loved it. It was great to bring him back like that. Uh, wrote time to do new material for him. A complete thrill. Why was that the right time to bring him back? Well, we live in a very politically correct time and we live in a very, you know, a, a censorious time. I don't think I've ever seen a more censorious time. And so someone like Buddy is perfect, you know, um, and I'm getting, you know, he's just, he just doesn't care. And that's part of it. Like, I think that the, that's a, there's a real power in not caring because I care, but, but Buddy doesn't. Buddy really doesn't give a shit what you think or what you do to him because you can't really hurt him. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I've never, I can never be hurt when I'm Buddy. The both of you have experience ha- having written on, on the show. You know, Scott, you saying that it's the most censorious time is interesting because there were different forms then, right? I mean, the- well, let's just say they're coming, the winds are coming from a different direction now. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. That's well, how much writing are you doing these days, Paul? Well, I teach. I actually teach sketch comedy uh, at a couple of different schools in Toronto. So I'm not doing any writing. I'm judging it which is kind of interesting um, because sometimes people write really good stuff, but they don't even know why it's good. They just follow an instinct. By and large, though, you know, it's hard to be a good writer right away. I think it takes a lot of practice. And I, was, I try to encourage them, but I do, I do that. I don't really write that much, you know, just the stuff I do with him, basically. How did you get into teaching? Well, a desperation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's been, right, it's been a bad theme in both of your careers. Oh my it sounds God. Like a- I reached a point where I was, I'd started at the top, literally with kids in the hall. And then every successive move was a step down. Because the, the show I did after that was a great Canadian show called This Hour's 22 Minutes. It was a little step down from kids in the hall. Not a big one. It was a good show. And then, you know, less and less. And finally, I'm doing reality shows and cooking shows and award shows and children's shows. All crap I would never watch. And I remember it came to an impasse. I was working on a script with the guys from Half Japanese, the Fair Brothers. And um, they hated it so much that it just, it all fell apart. And it was really sad. And uh, then the show I did after that was a cooking show. And I thought, this can't get any worse. So a friend of mine said, why don't you segue into teaching? And I thought, I don't know how to teach, but I um, figured it out. And it's a lot like performing. You know, you just have to get ready for a show and you're on for three hours. And you just do what you can to help people. Um, Paul's a great teacher and beloved. They love you, don't they? Students? My students like me because I, I treat them like writers yes. from, from day one. So I kind of flatter their creativity from the very beginning. And I think it really makes a difference. Do you feel that the experience of being a teacher has made you a better writer? Absolutely, because when you have to explain why something works or doesn't work, you come at it in a different way. 
You know, all the years on Kids in the Hall, it's just instinct. And all I was trying to do was keep up with the five of them, which, as you can imagine, was not an easy task. But you learn a lot. In fact, everything I learned was kind of after we were out of production, oh, tragically. Yeah. <laughs> so I became a better writer down the line when, when I didn't need it anymore, sadly. I wonder because there's all there's there, there's this entire like industry of comedy writing now. Um, you know, I'm out here. Obviously, we've got UCB and everything. The five of you and, and Paul and everybody else who was writing for the show at the time were really just coming to it. Yeah. Fresh. I mean, you, you didn't have any of that. I mean, is it? No, we did not. No. Is it possible to overthink comedy I writing? Mean, I do. I do think so. I think so. Um, well, I don't do anything to the students that I haven't done with you over the years. Like when you read me a piece, I go, that's good, but maybe blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I offer a suggestion. So I do the same thing with them that I do with you. And you're just trying to guide somebody's instinct in a certain direction. That's all. But I do think that there are a lot. People think that there are rules in comedy, which I don't agree with. Well, like, you, sometimes you got to learn some rules true. to break them. Yeah, but like there's this whole thing in the UCB school, etc., that you know what's the game and all that stuff. Oh, I don't yeah, quite all understand. Yeah, but that all comes from improv, and uh, we I don't know a thing about improv, and the kids in the hall were never about improv. God no, I never no. took an improv class in my life, so. Um, I don't know any of that. I only know how to write. When the kids started, you guys were essentially just writing new sketches, like entirely new sketches every week or something like that. Every two weeks, brand new shows. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously now, you know, the, the two of you are writing together. We're writing a new show. Yeah. People are too precious about creativity. How do you mean? Well, well, this whole idea about being blocked and all the rest of it. I'm at a stage now where I go, that's not possible. Even we well, it's really a, also, blocked. it's a two-stage process because you can write all you like, but at a certain point, you have to rehearse the damn thing and put it on its feet. And then it becomes a different thing, and the audience creates a different chemistry for the piece, too. All of a sudden, you see comic opportunities that you didn't even know were there because the audience is telling you. So it's always an evolution. Uh, with comedy. I'm guessing that writing that much that quickly early on taught you to not be particularly precious about that. Yes, I think so. I think so. Because there'll always be another idea. And, and, and you know, you, have to, you get to a point where you go, well, they're not all going to be great. They're not even all going to be good. You're also in a troop with five, I, I, from every conversation I've had with everybody individual, very opinionated guys and right. have very clear ideas about what's well, funny. Um, it sounds like there, I suspect there were a lot of opportunities where you had to just sort of give up on things and, and move on for the sake of the show. Almost everything is improved by the group. I think that's our secret is that lots of scenes in a normal group would go, I'm going to present this scene, we're going to do it. That was never the case with us. Everything got changed. Everything went through that mill. It doesn't matter if it was a monologue, whatever, everybody took a crack at your scene. There was mm-hmm. no such thing as anybody's scene. Really. You know, the kids in the hall had excellent quality control. Because, it, like you said, everybody worked on everything. Yeah. And there's definitely things where, where people went, that's shitty. Uh, and it either could get better or go in the dump. I was going to say, it, so- it sounds like nobody had any issues telling each other that something oh, sucked. God, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. This is the lesson. You mean, like, creatively, when you're, when you're part, you have to be blunt. You cannot no, go, absolutely. that's wonderful. Yeah, no one had any problems, and that's the worst idea I have. Ever. I think a lot of young comedians are soft on each other. I think that's part of the problem. People are too kind. Yeah. They're afraid of, of upsetting the balance or insulting a, a scene partner. But everything could always be better. Yeah, I think that's part. If every, every generation has their f- fatal flaws or their cracks, and I think this generation's flaw. Ours was insecurity, probably. Yeah, probably. But this one is more like they overthink things and, um, and are too worried about... How, offending people because yeah. that's life. There was an insecurity from the standpoint of you guys just be kind of putting yourselves out there. How, do, how did that come into play? Well, you know, back then, the, the gold standard was to be an athlete and to be heterosexual and to be popular and good looking. And when you're none of those things, you really have to choose a path that's going to work for you. And I think comedy is a real go-to for a lot of people lot for like ugly ducklings and insecure people they become good comedians and then they flourish they come into their own 
So insecurity goaded us. It didn't defeat us. One of the things I, I ask a lot of bands, and I, and I think this is certainly pertinent to Kids in the Hall, is for those groups, and, and this was a big thing in the 90s, you know, obviously there were all of these groups that were like getting major label record deals and would have this really big hit early on. And, you know, things happened, maybe didn't feel like it at the time, but in hindsight, things happened pretty quickly for the kids. Um, having that level of success that early on, ultimately, was it a blessing or a curse for your careers? Oh, it, both, I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, you peak at 30. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, but... We were I still in, wouldn't change it. We were in Canada, so nobody made a fuss well, about that's us part, at all. So that, nothing goes to your head. That is the beautiful thing about it. the kids in the hall. Never quite yeah, went we, that. We, we didn't become like addictive disaster. And we didn't become anything. superstars. So I think yeah. that was the, to me the greatest thing that ever happened to kids in the hall was not becoming huge. Yeah. It kept us hungry because I still think the five of us I mean, were still very hungry. When the group did sort of uh, unravel, the show stopped and, you know, the movie came out. I know, obviously, there, there are a lot of stories about tension happening there. But once once things were finally over, where where were you? What was, you know, was it clear, like, what the next step for each of you was going to be individually? No, panic. All of a sudden, it felt like, be, like having to leave home. Yeah. I, I hated it. Quite honestly, I, I was lucky because I went to Halifax and did this hour's 22 minutes and I was on that show for four years. It was very good. For I would have yeah, kept doing it a bit. Longer. I would have kept doing it quite honestly. I think that was a mistake. Yeah. We, but, but you do get tired. We were exhausted. exhausted. And, yeah. But I don't think I would say to people today, like you have to remember chemistry doesn't come around very often. Mm. And when you have it, you should really wring every drop out of it. And we're very lucky that the kids in the hall and everything just, and look, and our relationship has flourished over the years. And that's because we were, we never quite got there. So the lack, the lack of superstardom was ultimately the benefit. No one wants, I don't we're want still that. ambitious. I still feel ambitious. Yeah. yeah, I do. And I think that's a real blessing. I know people, I have a lot of friends who are way more successful on paper but they're jealous of us. And that's kind of weird because they're like, God, you still got the fire. Cause that's how I feel like, Oh my God. Kevin would always say, do we still have the eye of the tiger? Mm. And I go, yeah, I, I do. It's awful. And I wish I didn't. But yeah. It's one, it's one thing like having the eye of the tiger when you've got an Amazon deal or you've got this record deal. It's another thing having the eye of the tiger when nobody's knocking on your door. That's true. So this is a real blessing. Like this is definitely we're very lucky right now. Mm. I feel very, very lucky. Scott, I, I read the New Yorker piece and I read that you got really oh. into uh, stoicism during the pandemic. Obviously, we're all like sitting here trying to get enlightened. What was that process like for you? Well, it was it's it's wonderful. It's, I just, it's like discovering an old friend that I never even uh, that I, I, I had always been there that I never knew. And that sounds almost religious, but it's true. When I discovered Epictetus, I went, oh, this is the guy I've been looking for my whole life. He just said things so clearly to me that people have been trying to tell me forever and ever and ever that never really worked until I read it in his words. And I don't know why. I think it's because he was funny. And I realized this is a guy that suffered, but still managed to have such a beautiful, wonderful life. He made me laugh. And I, I don't know. And it was during the darkest times of the pandemic. I had to have surgery on my arm. I had to have my hand. My hand fell apart. I couldn't write any longer this hand fell apart basically and i had to have an operation on my hand it was a year ago during the pandemic maybe the third lockdown dead of winter i had my right arm in a cast for like three months i only had a left hand i was living alone and in the middle of the pandemic and i went this is unbelievably difficult i have one non-dominant hand i'm alone i can't see anyone i could only i couldn't even see paul really and so I was sitting in my car because I go to my car every day and I park somewhere and listen to the radio and read the paper. And I turned on the breakfast club. That's what, and um, that got Ryan holiday was on. He was talking about Epictetus and Epictetus's quote was, um, we all have to die, but we don't have to die bawling. And I thought, Oh my God, that is me. I over, I exaggerate everything. I'm just such a fool. And I just went, that's it. I just went that, and I just stayed there and listened to the whole thing and went, holy fuck, that's exactly who I need to find. And I did, because it's weird. Like, I, I'm, I'm kind of a hysteric. So for me to like, try to embrace stoicism is insane. I'll, I'll probably be the worst student. I am the worst student ever. Boy, it, it helps. It's helped me a lot. 
Yeah, and, that's, and I, that is because of the pandemic. It might have come to me anyways, because I'd read these things before, like, you know, that are modern, and I went, I need something from 2,000 years ago. <laughs> that, that, you know what I mean? I need something from 2,000 years something ago. Something that stood the test of time. Yes, that's what it was. And so that was it. Yeah. So I, I, do you know, who I'm t- you know who I'm talking about, right? I've read right, right up on him a little bit, but um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you found something that works. been a long time I read Seneca. I've been reading Marcus Aurelius. They're all it, these Stoics from thousands of years ago, and it seems so modern to me right now. It's just all about, it's all about letting things, you, you can't control the world. You just have to control how you react. And I've always reacted like, like a fool. Like, you know what I mean? Like I let, every, I let the world play me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a violin. I went, ah, I'm gonna, it's time for me not to react to everything. Even though we'll see how that works out. <laughs> <laughs>